Is St. Augustine's memory philosophy practical? Or is it just intellectual noodling from yet another philosopher of times past? If you're interested in St. Augustine's comments on memory but aren't sure exactly what he was going on about, you can be assured of one thing. I believe what Augustine had to say about memory is more than just interesting, and it's not intellectual noodling. Far from it. Even where Augustine's philosophy of memory does not gel with contemporary science, it's astonishing how close some of his thinking gets to what we now believe is true about memory. Plus, when we think through Augustine's ideas, this is itself a good memory and critical thinking exercise, so it's worth learning about just for the mental workout. Now, straight up, a fit mind will always be able to learn faster than a flabby one. So, once you understand St. Augustine on memory better, you'll make better learning choices too, and that's what we're going to talk about in this episode of the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. So if you're new here, get subscribed, hit that thumbs up, and who was St. Augustine? Well, Augustine of Hippo lived from 354 AD to 430. He's remembered for essentially inventing the autobiography and autohagiography by writing his confessions. At least that's what I think some people say. And is it the first autobiography? I don't know, but you know, you might as well pin it on somebody, I guess, right? This literary offering, The Confessions, is quite unique. Uh, as Andrea Nightingale points out, a substantial part of how and why he was made a saint comes from things he said about himself. Not only that, but Augustine helped show how we interpret texts, a process known as exegesis, and it bears a lot of relationship to what we now call semiotics. And because Augustine focused so much on his own memory and memory at large in his works, he has shaped how many cultures have come to interpret the experience of having a self. Now, we'll get more into why this contribution to our culture to this day is so important in a moment, but we want to note that Augustine also explored many other issues. For example, he discussed the nature of evil, the nature of desire, and also the philosophical ideas of Plato, and that's just for starters. He wrote prolifically. His City of God is not only studied as a book of Christian philosophy, it was a key part of my political science program when I was an undergrad, and it's a very, very good text to compare and contrast with Plato's Republic, for example. And, you know, if you're interested in memory, there's a memory aspect to Plato as well that's very strong and interesting. Augustine was also deeply interested in the liberal arts and the memory and persuasion skills, kind of skills that you would find discussed in Rhetorica ad Herenium. And he held critical thinking to be very important, and he demonstrated several ways to perform deeper and more critical thought in his works. So, what was St. Augustine's philosophy of the mind and memory? Well, Augustine has been very influential on people who use memory techniques, and in fact, it's possible that the term memory palace maybe comes from his oft-quoted line, and I come to the fields and spacious palaces of my memory, where are the treasures of innumerable images brought into it from things of all sorts perceived by the senses. But when it comes to mnemonics, Augustine's philosophy of memory is useful in a more roundabout way. And as I share with you the main points I've picked up from reading him, we're going to patch some of those valuable angles in. So the first thing is, I think, and maybe the most important, is that Augustine is trying to help you meditate on the nature of data, right? And there's kind of a, a scale. You have data, then you have information, and then you have knowledge, and then you have wisdom. And I think this is an important point because Examples of autobiography prior to Augustine are hard to find, and if there were any models he had to copy, they were probably few and far in between. Paula Fredrickson suggests that Augustine probably had the Pauline epistles, and these books of the Bible are letters and certainly have an element of reflective thinking related to autobiography and probably autohagiography as well. But Augustine isn't just writing about himself. He's thinking deeply about the nature of his memory and how it allows him to consider facts about his own experience. So to use modern terms, he's essentially thinking about how the mind collects data and then transforms it into a useful form. And again, we have this term data where we have gathered something where through analytical thinking, we can basically transform it into information or gather it into form that becomes information, hence the 
word form in information. And then he considers how that information becomes knowledge and ultimately wisdom. Now, these aren't merely philosophical questions of epistemology. They are questions of the art and science of how we know something is true or false and how we can reflect on it philosophically in many, many ways beyond epistemology. We can think about things ontologically, for example, which is the nature of being itself. And that's a, what is happening in confessions a lot. He's asking what is the nature of his being, and often he does it through the lens of not just memory, but the experience of memory. So there are a lot of interesting paradoxes as he reflects on the nature of his personal experience of memory, and one of the reasons why confessions is so important and has stood the test of time is because as people read him reflecting on the nature of being with memory or the ontology of memory, Augustine observes that you know he can remember a time when he felt joyful, yet he can do it in a neutral state. And it's really weird if you think about this and you experience thinking through happy memories, but in a neutral way, without judging them, without even labeling them. And this mental exercise suggests that there may be a difference between information or just raw data and sensation. And in some sense, that's what wisdom is, the ability to distinguish between the data and the information and the knowledge and the wisdom so that you can think about it in a non-emotional way. And this is so important because it helps us trust others, which is basically what I interpret out of some of the things that Augustine is saying. We can use this partitioning out of what information is versus data versus knowledge and wisdom in a way that helps us not get caught up in things like superstition. We get to analyze things rationally, and sometimes we can even let go of bad memories that we may have about other people or groups. And maybe another way of making this point is that part of our memory allows for rational and logical thinking. So we can use our memory to sort, sift, and screen a variety of sensations or data that we have about the sensations that we've experienced, and then we can use our minds to make them more meaningful, specifically through the application of categorizing them, making them into information, in form, right? And so I believe Augustine's reflective thinking on categories probably influenced Ramon Lowell's development of the memory wheel. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I, th I think it's a fair guess that something like that may have been going on in the history of ideas, the history of structured thought, the history of memory. To take things a step further, Augustine seems to suggest that we use our memory to make memory itself meaningful to us. And also, it's almost like nestic memory. So nestic memory is M-N-E-S-T-I-C, and it is basically like the memory of memories, the memory of memory itself. Think of this from the Confessions. The interior sense perceives not only the things referred to it by the five senses, but also the sensations themselves. Then later, Augustine writes that memory is a faculty of myself and belongs to my nature. In fact, I cannot totally grasp all that I am. The mind is not large enough to contain itself. When I remember memory, my memory is present to itself by itself. Nothing is so much in the memory as memory itself. Anamnesis seems to suggest that we're uncovering or unhiding or discovering something in memory that is already there. And one of the famous words for this in Greek, ancient Greek, is alataia, which is truth, but it means unhiding, this process of finding what is already there inside your memory. And Augustine frames it in the form of a question. He says, how did I recognize things I did not know and say, yes, that is true? The answer must be that they were already in my memory, but remote and pushed back as in the most secret caverns. Now, I think this is a feel-good idea. It allows for a philosophy in which humans are made in the image of a creator. Memory becomes a tool that allows the seeker to find God through a process of inquiry into memory. And Augustine says, O oh, lovely light, I shall pass beyond memory to find you. But where will I find you? If I find you beyond my memory, then I shall be without memory of you. And how will I find you if I am without memory of you? And Augustine's answer is that the memory of God is built into the system. It is discovered by unhiding what was already there. 
But these days, many of us recognize a more Darwinistic impulse towards belief as a survival strategy in the face of a universe in which life is the exception to the rule, with no empirical demonstration of a reason why anything should exist. And there's a material reductionism here. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I would probably personally follow more a materialism than an idealism, for example. But I think that, you know, we all need to work these things through. And Augustine is so good at helping us think these thoughts and think about them through the lens of memory. And another important realm here is that Augustine's a priori style of thinking about memory is something we can think about in terms of Nietzsche's rumination on memory, especially in his book, Human All to Human. So I just use this word rumination, and I think that's another aspect that is so powerful in Augustine. He sees memory as something like the series of stomachs that you see in cows. They have these multiple stomachs, and he says that memory is the stomach of the mind, and that it digests different kinds of thoughts at different rates of speed, maybe at the speed of data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And some of these thoughts that pass through these multiple stomachs, he may have picked up from Stoicism. So he has these four perturbations, or perturbations. There's fear, desire, joy, and sadness. And these are categories we can think through when trying to understand memories that arise through autobiographical memory processes when we're thinking about our own lives. Or we can use these specific categories when thinking about what it is that we want to do in the future. And this would include thinking through what sometimes holds us back from taking action on those things that we really need to get done. Uh, I, I, all of this is just super influential on the history of the memory tradition, the memory wheels with Ramon Lull, I'm sure of it, and Ars Combinatoria in Giordano Bruno. And so long story short, I think Augustine seems preternaturally aware that short-term memory or working memory operates more efficiently when we're dealing with smaller units of information and letting them pass through these different stages. Less becomes more because we become aware of different stages, different categories of where we can focus on, is it data? Is it information? Is it knowledge? Is it wisdom? Now, although Augustine goes to great length that memory is essentially spiritual in his view, I think he's ultimately very practical. He sees memory as something that can be astonishingly easy for some things, like remembering the colors and the days of the week. And part of this effect, St. Augustine notes, is coming from something we call context-dependent memory. But also, there's a amount of spaced repetition that we benefit from with quotidian everyday information. So memory of colors, days of the week, numbers, these come up over and over and over and over and over again that we wind up being able to remember them a lot easier than other things. But there are kinds of information that are very, very difficult. And Augustine doesn't necessarily have a very good answer when he suggests that all of this understanding of even the most complicated topics are already in your mind and just need to be uncovered or unhidden. He does have a practical tip. He says that the ability to remember and understand ultimately shapes your ability to succeed. So kind of do whatever it takes to get it done. You have to be able to demonstrate an understanding because you need to judge your own passions to avoid bad behaviors and the negative outcomes that they create. The experience of joy, he tells us, essentially comes from studying and understanding the information and the knowledge that helps guide your actions towards joy. And doing this will, in the memory world, help you create better mnemonic images as you practice the art of memory. I always encourage you to learn as much as you can about the history of memory, the philosophy of memory, because it's going to help you reinforce your mnemonic systems. If you didn't know St. Augustine before that you watched this video, you can look up a painting of him, several illustrations of him, and now you can use his name in your own linking whenever you have to think of something. Like if you use a mnemonic calendar, you can have St. Augustine for the month of August and then connect him with a number system for each day, each hour, 
in a mnemonic calendar for August. Like it's just wonderful how that all works. And it's very, very practical. And you could spend the month of August memorizing some of his wisdom and that may be more and more challenging. Is it gonna uncover things that you always already knew? Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that that actually exists, but it is something that you have to figure out and explore. And certainly there are non-existent things that you can discover like numbers and some of the concepts related to liberal arts and then realize, I, I, always, I, I did think that way. You just didn't have words for the way that you thought before, which may be part of where this idea of anamnesis comes from. Okay, so I think that we really have many, many important things in Augustine, and I think he understands the nature of information in a way that Giordano Bruno did, that Galileo did to a certain extent. Information as something that is for all intents and purposes, infinite, it's unfolding in time. And as Augustine says, when he talks about interpreting scripture, not one line is exhaustible because the more you think about it, the more you're gonna be able to connect it to other lines of scripture. And just in your own life, you're gonna think about different scripture that you've memorized and see how it relates to different moments in your day. And it is inexhaustible as far as I can tell. And so, He's a great memory expert in my view. His memory, as he admits, is not perfect. Far from it. And Augustine uses mnemonics with passion because he observes that God himself uses mnemonics. And if you don't quite believe that immediately, just look at Genesis 9, 13 to 15. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the cloud, that I will remember my covenant. Well, if putting a rainbow against the backdrop of the sky as a reminder isn't the memory palace technique writ large, I don't know what is. No wonder Aaron Katz called his book on mnemonics, Where Did Noah Park the Ark? Because it's one of the most obvious uses of the memory palace technique in all of literature. It's in the Bible. God does it too. So why shouldn't we? Now, there's so much more to glean from reading St. Augustine on memory yourself. My goal has been to show you how Augustine's observations about memory land on many of the features that scientists have confirmed and named in our area. And even though we just touched on that a little bit, there's so much more to explore. Augustine didn't need spreadsheets and graphs and brain scans to use memory in multiple ways as a kind of concentration meditation, as a means of being able to remember more things, as a means to meditate and reflect on the nature of God, as a means of being able to meditate on the nature of himself. And memory really is like that castle or that palace that he talked about, spreading, limitless, like a room within me. And that's another phrase that he uses. It's spreading limitless, or it is a spreading limitless room within me. And if you'd like to experience that yourself, I would just get into learning to focus on the memory skills themselves, learning how to use a memory palace. Get my free kit at magneticmerrymethod.com. It will take you through the memory palace technique so that you have rooms spreading within yourself. And before you know it, you will have a memory and an experience of perceiving your own memory as a sensation that senses all the other sensations or a nestic memory that helps you experience all the other levels of memory. Who can reach memory's utmost depth? Augustine asks. Well, the answer is you can. So please make sure you do. Now it's time for this week's What I'm Reading. And I am reading Dying for Ideas. This is a very interesting book. It connects to my research on Giordano Bruno. I'm working on another draft of my book, The Infinite Memory Palace Technique of Giordano Bruno. And although I don't quite agree with some of the things that is said about Bruno, I'm very glad that some of the things that I do think are confirmed in this book. And you will see references to that when you read The Infinite Memory Palace of Giordano Bruno yourself. But I highly recommend this book. It's quite philosophical in its way but I think a very important study of why some people just sacrifice their lives to certain ideas. And I mean, in some way, you almost want to find an idea worth sacrificing yourself to. Mine has been memory. I hope you enjoy how I do it. If you haven't 
hit that thumbs up yet, please do so. Get subscribed. And if you'd like more on the philosophy of memory with some practical ideas about how to improve it, I would suggest you carry on while you're here and watch my video on Nietzsche next. I mentioned Nietzsche today, and it's really about whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stronger, except for I don't believe that's what Nietzsche said. So I reflect a little bit philosophically and guided by memory science. I don't think philosophy is worth a dime if it's not guided by memory science in our day and era. But anyway, I reflect on why we might have chopped off half of that quote and the consequences of doing so, which I think Nietzsche gives a nice alternative way to think about memory the way St. Augustine thought about it. So go ahead, watch that video next. Thanks as always. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.